I'm slightly just winging this now because we've never <laughs> done one of these before, but um, <laughs> yeah, you know, we've done, we've certainly winged quite a lot of things in our career. We have. Uh, careers uh, even which is one of which is one of the questions actually that (laughs) that somebody has has uh, Nicole has asked and that we'll come back to what would you have done if you hadn't been writing and speaking about crime what sort of career would you have had oh I know what I would have done so we'll come back to that (laughs) yeah so anyway we asked you to send in some questions and we've had so many that we're actually only going to get through some so we will what we'll do is we'll filter these questions in through the podcast from now on. You yeah, know? and we might do, yeah, we might do part two. We might do part two, but for just for this, we're going to dedicate this podcast to some of the listeners and the viewers' questions. Um, and by the way, if you're listening, you send your questions to crimeworldpod at gmail.com. Well done. Or you can slide into my DMs. <laughs> You can. And anybody, you can certainly slide anybody, into Niall's DMs. Anybody can slide in with anything. Because let me tell you this, when we were on the road doing, um, doing <laughs> look, when we were on the road doing our shows, um, Niall was quite the popul- popular guy. And there was a few ladies who slid into your DMs, wasn't there? Well, it was very mild, but the, the only, <laughs> very mild, but uh, the only, the only, the real mistake I make is telling you about any, any level <laughs> Yeah, of no, engagement, you know. That was a fabulous story. I mean, I do remember. Yeah. I'm not even going to say what part of the country, but uh, no, no. it was a particular one that had slid into your DMs late at night. And uh, you did make the big mistake of telling me about it. Yeah. I think I told you I wouldn't tell anyone. Yeah. So anyway. So here we are. Now, the first one I wanted to read out in was, did actually slide into my DMs. So this listener has apologised for sliding into my DMs. I got a question. With so many podcasts out there with former criminals like Sammy the Bull Gravano, Darren G, Marvin Herbert, is there an Irish equivalent? Well, there's there's not. And we definitely don't have a culture, I think, of ex-criminals speaking. Now, we have had some over the years that have done a series of interviews, but there isn't an Irish equivalent. And would there be a market Oh, I think people would watch if there was an Irish equivalent. But um, yeah, so just for anybody who doesn't know what these podcasts are. So firstly, Sammy the Bull Gravano is an informant, a mafia rat, who has survived despite his evidence putting away countless mafiosos uh, in the US. And he's an elderly guy now and he runs this quite odd podcast, but he does. Um, and he's not alone in the States. There's quite a lot of ex mafiosa who are running what are essentially talk shows. Yeah, I mean, they're interviewing each other yeah. about the life. Um, and they go back over some quite interesting, like if you have any interest in, in, in Philadelphia, for example, or, you know, New York, or you'll find sort of mafia figures, sometimes suspected mafia figures from all these regions. And they, they do sort of tell stories if, if, if that's your thing. And you're interested in digging down into the stories of the past. Yeah, but I think the ones that people will be most uh, maybe familiar with would be people like Darren G, who was a Liverpool uh, criminal, very well known. And he's appeared on a number of different podcasts telling his story. Now, there isn't an Irish equivalent at the moment because you can see... Um, he's not really a podcaster, though, no, Darren he, G. He, no. He's an, it's sort of a... He's a, a guest. He's a bit of a crazy kind of a social media star maybe star what yeah. we call him and he, yeah. and he sort of videos himself sometimes on 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 um, his bicycle going around liverpool yeah. he puts up some content that is sort of you know calling out his rivals he's certainly a colorful character there's no doubt about it i have laughed out loud a few times at some of his stuff marvin herbert was a a, a criminal as well he was he's a self professed sort of hitman enforcer type. Yeah. Maybe an enforcer would be a better word for that. Who actually wound up, rattled up working in MGM gym in Marbella when uh, Daniel Kinahan and Matthew Macklin were were running it there. And he's a colourful past. He has one eye because the other one was shot from his head. And he has survived numerous assassination attempts and all the rest of it. And he sort of has clung to this 
helping kids move away yeah. from crime thing. Yeah. And he is running his, his own podcast, which is quite aggressive. Yeah. Um, because he fights with the other podcasters. Yeah. Uh, and he tries to you have see, them. You there, see, there's a kind of a Wild West thing that has gone on in, in sort of crime podcasting in the UK. Um, and certainly it was always said, I'm not f- focusing on any one podcast in particular. There was a belief that... Um, people like Daniel Kinnan were manipulating some of the podcasters because you get criminals on and they'll speak a very lengthy, often over an hour, um, and they'd be interviewed by somebody and they're very maybe unchallenged, I suppose, in their interviews. It's very Totally so, unchallenged. Yeah. They're yeah. allowed to actually tell their story, their narrative, whatever way they want. Yeah. And so, and that's fair enough. Social media, that's the way it is. You can, you can, you can do it and if people like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't have to watch it. But what it is, is that it eventually it kind of descended a bit in that there became these rivalries and people were pushing these opposing narratives. That hasn't happened in Ireland um, yet. That sort of grip, I suppose, of, I suppose, amateur There's essentially two main crime podcasters yeah. in the UK. There's Sean Atwood. Yeah who served time in prison himself and he was caught smuggling drugs. A middle class kind of guy. A middle class guy, actually met him at Crime Con, nice guy. Um, He interviews ex-crims. I think he has a little bit, I think there's an intimacy there because of his own situation. Um, Hugely popular and a hugely legitimate uh, business he's built up for himself. He writes books and all the rest of it. Um, so he has kind of legitimized himself, gone clean, but he's making an honest living out of crime. Yeah. There's another guy, a Scottish guy called James English. And I don't know much about his his background, but he was married or in a relationship with Kerry Catone. <laughs> well, he was stage, in a relationship with Kerry like Catone. No, I mean, he, he's written an autobiography about his own background, how he become involved in crime as a, as a young, very young man. Um, and then... I turned his life around and it ended up, I think, on some reality TV shows, hadn't okay. he? And, and had at some point gone out with Kerry Katona, um, I'd probably <laughs> relatively briefly. I know, and it sticks to him And like then he'd glue. become involved in, in comedy, I think. And then it eventually had sort of morphed into being a, a podcaster. Podcaster. Yeah. And he has hundreds of podcasts out now at this stage and probably a really good business going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he seems to sort of sell and narrate his own ads yeah. uh, on the thing. But these are these big, long interviews. They're sometimes can go up to three hours long. I find some of them I'm interested in. You see, they're not all criminals that he no. interviews. A lot of them would be boxers, sports stars, um, influencers, those sort of page three model types and all the rest of it. People who've had all sorts of experiences in life. But in the midst of it, he does have quite a few of these aging gangsters, I suppose, yeah. which there's so many of in the yeah. UK, in Scotland. It's the population, obviously, yeah. that brings more of them than our own. But there's also because I think they've started talking and sitting down and telling their stories that encourages o- others. And there, there's a little bit of an element of some of those criminals when they have kind of gone through a certain part of their career, they're more comfortable sitting down yeah. and talking. Um, and there's a little bit of, or a large bit of narcissism yeah. there. I mean, in particular, I was watching a, 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 and Johnny Adair has done podcasts about three or four times I've seen them. Yeah. They're all incredibly long. He starts telling his story and he takes no direction from the interviewer. Yeah. He just talks. There's a narcissism to that, you know, um, an ego to it. But I've, you could actually just, as, as, as English often does at the beginning of his interviews, he says, tell me about your background. Where, did, where were you born? Where did you grow up? And he can sit back and the likes of Johnny Adair, you know, let go later. Yeah. <laughs> now, I mean, if you talk about uh, celebrity gangsters, there's one big black hole at the centre of it. We have 60 seconds of, is it 60 seconds of James English interviewing a Dan. man? We, did we ever mention him before? Daniel Kinnan? Dan. Dan Kinnan. People yeah. who followed these things would have seen it before. There was a 60 second preview put out for a podcast that was due to come out on, on Paddy's Day, wasn't it? And yes. it was an interview with Daniel. Yeah. And you, there's an interview with Daniel Kinnan and he, in the, the short clip he's describing the Regency Hotel shooting, isn't it? And this is James English was flown out or flew out to Dubai to conduct this interview and we were told that it was going to be three hours long. Yeah. 
and you can just you see a bit of footage of it. It's Daniel Kinnan. He's I think he's showing how a gunman the gunman removed his gun and started shooting, um, and he's also denying um, being involved in in cocaine trafficking. I think um, so. That's there. Mm-hmm. Now, what has happened to that? Where is that footage? I have no idea. And we, d- we never really got to the bottom because it was pulled. It was supposed to go out on Patrick's Day. And of course, by the April, weeks yeah. later, as I was flying off to Italy for a ski holiday, he's f- sanctioned. Yeah. And that was it totally panned then yeah. because. Yeah. But there was some sort of a, a row or something was going on behind the scenes. Never got to the bottom of it. Why it was never published as planned, a broadcast rather as planned. There was a lot of money went into getting the crew and everything out there. I think it was filmed actually in the offices in, in the Jamera. Um, Bay, the Bay building the, the or whatever. Building, the, yeah. the office suites building. But yeah, that is somewhere in the ether in the ether and will no doubt will but be. I think um, like Irish criminals uh, or even retired criminals haven't had the same culture in as they have in the UK in particular but also in the US of speaking Do you think there's not enough of them? I think the, I think that's also maybe a stronger part of our culture the culture of silence yes. I think that is much more baked into um, Irish criminal culture but yeah, Irish culture yeah. probably in general um, and I think also Irish people are maybe a bit less show off than the Americans in general. But you know what? If somebody breaks rank, they'll all go for it. Because yeah. I find that as well. Because it, I would say there's an element of some of the, the sort of the more veteran criminals, shall we say. There's a bit of an embarrassment. I'm not going to I'm not going to do that yeah, because yeah. everyone will laugh at me. And of course, you can see it in the North now. We have more and more ex-paramilitaries will, will speak about it. But it, I think things have to pass mm. before. Um, people start talking. So it may well be in a decade you'll see. The paramilitaries maybe have, you know, or can certainly not excuse themselves for talking, but but can talk because their stories are all about that social history though, aren't yes, they? Yes, but the, I think we will get in a decade's time, we'll get a lot of people speaking about the rise of really high level organised crime in Ireland. Yeah. Guys that are then who, in their like, 50s. Well, I don't know. People who do you think be, we talk? Well, I just think some of the people mixed up with the Kinnan and Hutch feud, for example, I can't pick out who they will be. They will come out of prison. They will have served relatively lengthy prison sentences. So they'd be free to talk about mm. some of the crimes they've been committed. They'd be in their 50s. They'll, that world will have passed. And I think you'll get some of them to talk. Yeah, and they probably came up in a much more social media yeah. world than, than yeah. probably the last generation. It always amazes me, like you, I'm sure, like yeah. myself, I speak to people all the time, um, in particular on the fringes and the surrounds of the Kinahan organization. Um, and they've some story to tell. Like, I they mean, really just do. going, please. Let, and of I mean, course, you can't, and you would never break confidence or whatever. And a lot of the information is very useful for other reasons that it's, it's coming through. But they've incredible stories to tell and incredible insights into key individuals because, you know, it's that sort of um, intimacy with somebody. It's all very well for us to be spouting yeah. on about this, that and the other. And this is what the person is like. But when you speak to somebody who has spent a considerable amount of time in the company of the likes of Daniel Kinahan, Christy Kinahan Sr., you get a real insight. You do. And, you know, those things will become social history at mm. some point. You're already seeing a degree of, you know, what was so uh, alive and, and risky that Hutch Kinahan feud. It's already starting to become mm-hmm. an historic situation. So I think the time will come when people will speak. But I do But think I wonder, do you know what? And and like even if you look at the current day, they're not speaking to journalists because no. maybe they never will. I yeah. mean maybe that's just that feels like the establishment and that's yeah. like speaking and, and to they're police. Probably right, yeah. So I mean they're doing it under the cover of darkness and and you know encryption and and through secretive meetings speaking to journalists and police as well, right? But it's the, the sort of that podcasting world where they sit down, they'd sit down maybe with one another and have a conversation. So what we need is, and actually the second bit of this question is, in actual fact, <laughs> uh, can you see Jerry Hutch doing the, a podcast anytime soon? Now, is that as a guest or as a host? Well, I think it must be as a guest. It I must think. be as a guest. Well, I mean, the simple answer to that is no. Um, Jerry Hutch I don't believe is going to do any media interviews, certainly not mainstream media interviews. Um, I think 
you'd have to try and put yourself in his shoes and say what's in it for him. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what is the motivation to speak Mm. is always an issue for journalists, whether it's a story to do a crime or celebrity or politics. A person has to have a motivation to speak. Yeah. Now, you've spoken about a lot of these retired gangsters and in in those things, their motivation, I think, is just a bit of an ego trip. A little bit, yeah. But I think Jerry Hutch is a different sort of character. Mm. Um, He is being pictured at Kelly Harrington's you know, fight. He doesn't need the ego trip. Like if he's mm. looking for that kind of uh, public profile, if you want, or even mm. that soft and public profile, he's already getting it. Um, let's not be naive about it and not forget that the Hutch Organised Crime Group remain a target for the Gardaí. Um, somebody going on the record in a public interview puts themselves at risk. Mm. Um, and also remember Jerry Hutch did do an extensive interview with Paul Reynolds in with RTE when, but I mean, that's over 15 years oh, ago. Oh, it was it years it? ago. I think it was yeah. when the rival station, which was TV3 at the time, yeah, Virgin or, Media Now, were putting out a, a thing about the Criminal Assets Bureau and they were heavily sort of telling the story of him. And I think that's why he did that. But I think the thing is about the difference between the podcasters, we'll call them the Wild West yeah. podcasters, yeah. that they can allow somebody to tell their story. They don't challenge them on anything. Yeah. As a journalist working for a commercial organization yeah. or as a journalist, if you define yourself as a journalist, you cannot allow somebody go unchallenged about things or you're not a journalist. No. So it's a kind of a place, it's it's probably an uncomfortable place to try and yeah. Sit crime. Yeah. Because of course you'd have to ask any anybody, any of these big criminals about their career. They ain't going to tell you on the record about stuff they got away with. No, they're not. And also then, um, you know, yeah, exactly. So I can't see Jerry Hutch starting to pop up on podcast. Bill and Bob's podcast. No. We interviewed Jerry Hutch today. I don't, uh, I it's don't. It's a pity. Maybe one of these days. And of course, you'd always be very welcome, as with Daniel Kinahan yeah. or any of the rest of them in yeah. here, should they so choose to uh, to to come. Anyway, that's that question. Um, what I wanted to say to you was, right, so apart from questions, I do get <laughs> like some really quite funny. I'm actually going to start collecting them, mm. emails from people, you know, 90% of what is broadcast, and I don't actually mean here, but in general on radio and stuff, and 90% of what goes out in media is actually marketing, yeah. right? So there's all this huge, big world of marketing out there. I mean, if you listen to, say, RTE, yeah. um, Morning Ireland or something like that, you will hear the, the the stories of the day that are happening, news stories, but you'll hear all these other things. And of course, they've all really been brought together by press releases and all the rest. Companies send in releases around everything from climate to whatever they're involved in and they offer up expert speakers and all the rest of it. And um, so I get quite a bit of this. I think back in the day, there used to be dedicated PR people who approached physically and brought journalists out for coffee and sat down and targeted the ones that were more sort of meeting their clients' needs or whatever. But nowadays that The whole world seems to have changed as well. So I get a lot of stuff um, offering me up interviews with people, offering me sort of, um, you know, do you want to speak to the CEO of this, that and the other? And I often send back, do you really think crime world (laughs) is, is, am I missing something here or whatever? And anyway, I do think this was one of those, but I thought it was pretty good anyway. So this is a follow up email. Hi, Nicola. I'm wondering if you've received my email regarding our guide to sending money to Colombia. <laughs> Would love to hear your thoughts on it. I do wonder, do they, is there some algorithm somewhere where they search for podcasters who've mentioned Colombia? Possibly. I, that's, I mean, that's the only way they could possibly have come up but with But I just laughed at that and I thought to myself, um, mm, do, you know, do we need to know how to send money to Colombia? Yeah. What would yeah. we be buying? Yeah. I wonder. Well... Huh? It, maybe it would be a good podcast, I have it, to say. It, it would. Now, next question. Okay, we'll start this one off. Hi, lads. Love the pod, but had two questions that have driven me mad for a long time. Please answer for me. Firstly, Mago Gately, do you have any idea where the nickname came from? Now, well, I haven't a clue. Well, I was always told with Mago Gately, um, his mother is called Mago Gately. Is that like Margaret? Oh. I presume it's Margaret. Yeah. Um, but she's known as Mago. And simply 
due to the fact that his that, that his mother is called Mago, he became known as Mago. And yeah. now I'd be I, I'm I'm willing to not stake my re- my journalistic reputation on that. But that's yeah. what I was told. He was simply just his mother's name was transferred to him, just like I mean you know obviously a very tragic story to do with an old duck egg Kirwin. Yeah. But he's obviously called, and this is what I was told as well, he's called duck egg because his father was known as duck. Yeah. Had the nickname duck and therefore he be, just automatically yeah. becomes duck egg and that's transplanted down the generations. And you know, that could have something to do with, you often see it down in rural communities where, you know, there'd be O'Sullivan's or the, yeah, the yeah. white O'Sullivan's yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's because there would be many people of the same yes, name yes. within communities yeah, so to exactly. distinguish them. And of course, people always, uh, Stephen Gately, who was in Boyzone, and people always used to stop me and say, he must be, is he Mago's brother oh, what or was cousin? he now that you mentioned that? Well, I don't think he had anything to do with it, but he was obviously from... The born, same area. He was born in Sheriff Street. They're both born in Sheriff Street, or at least yeah. lived a large part of their lives in Sheriff Street, but there's no family connection. Right. So, you know, when you're saying that's, you know, James Mago Gately or James Gately. Yeah. That yeah, was yeah, obviously, yeah. this is what I was told, that it was just distinguished from the other Gately's that, that had no relation. Mm. That's Mago Gately. Mm. Um, so, and... Um, Gately's an unusual name, I would have thought. Well, it is, but there's a lot of, uh, yeah, there's... There, there, there probably is a lot in a particular community or whatever. There, yeah, there, yeah. There, there must be. I mean, yeah. it's, it's yeah, the, 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 the names can be interesting, actually, of yeah. course, because you can see... It's not the worst nickname, Michael. No, it's not. It's I mean, not. We've, we've really, really heard of far worse than that. And, and, and well, many what's, of them, what's your most unpleasant uh, gangster nickname? Well, I mean, I always think that in the underworld or gangland, yeah. whatever you'd call it, that your, your worst feature... Is always sort of. Well, I just tell you my the low the worst nickname, and I can't even remember the guy's name, and I still <laughs> slag our colleague <laughs> Ken Foy about it. What is it? Um, now somebody will maybe remember who it is, but he had a gangster called Red Balls. <laughs> 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 the paper. I always thought, ah, no, but that yeah, there was. And look, that's what he—that's what he was called on who? the street. Chris what? by who? Well, Chris. No, I mean, and we had—he yeah. had his full name in it, like you know. Yeah. So, but that's what obviously he was known. But yeah, that. That's and of course, Terence Big Balls wasn't he in uh, in Love Hate? That's right. Yeah. That's right. But Red Balls is slightly. And less. like I remember us did, slagging and did, off the Big and Balls. And he did have ginger hair. Oh criminal. God! Now that's you've just <laughs> sort of warning. Um, Go on. No, I think that you know, there's so many. Guys, yeah. like who have fat in their, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, fat. <laughs> well, I mean, Freddie like, Thompson, fat Andy Connors, um, um, fat John McCarthy in Limerick, yeah, fat Puss, fat Bradley, Puss, yeah, uh, and that's who just, isn't particularly fat, is he? N- no, he, 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 oh. he, he, well, he he went from fat Puss to fit Puss. Do you remember that was a headline in the <laughs> Sunday World when he because he remember he entered Mister um, Mister Ireland that's or right. whatever. But wasn't F- Freddie Thompson fit Freddie Thompson Freddie as well? He did at become one stage. fit Freddie yeah. Thompson. Um, but there's a lot of that goes on, and you know, isn't there? I mean, I think in the north, they're particularly like, yeah. Well, unkind. I mean, there's some some great nickname. There was a guy called uh, <laughs> No Neck McGraw. We had we used to have in the paper. <laughs> Was he good again? <laughs> yeah. And there was also... I mean, uh, that's unkind. So. It is a bit unkind. Yeah. I mean, I can't even remember the picture if he had no neck, but I presume he did. And there was the meerkat because he kept popping up everywhere. <laughs> that's not so bad. There was a guy called the nose as well, wasn't there? I mean, there was. A, there was. Kind of a hawk-like structure on his and face. And there was a guy with the nickname Hard to Kill. Yeah. He did eventually die, so I don't Hard know. Hard to Kill. Yeah. Do you remember there was that other fellow wobbly legs? And oh, I do think yeah, the man had yeah, some yeah, sort yeah. of a, you know, so yeah. it's just, and it's not actually the media that, no. that christened these. Well, it usually comes from their community. It, or it their, usually is, but the media have christened people. Yeah. Uh, and when the media have christened people, you can look at them, the names are quite, um, for example, Jerry the Monk Hutch. Jerry Hutch was never known as the monk in, uh, on the streets of Dublin. That was a nickname I think was given to him by Veronica Gearin who wrote a series of stories about people who Jerry Hutch at the time, of course, had very little convictions and still does. So she christened him the monk. Mm. And that was a name given by the newspapers. And we've done that ourselves over the years. Yeah. Mr. Big being, you know, one of the most ones that is used recently. I mean, no, people probably do call him Mr. Big now, but they yeah. certainly didn't at the time. But if you look at the nicknames given by the papers, there was the Colonel John mm. Cunningham, the general, mm. the monk, they're, they're all quite, quite respectable. Quite impressive, con- aren't they? Yeah, quite impressive nicknames. Yeah. But the nicknames from the streets tend to be 
uh, you know, fat, fat or... And what about Flashy and, uh, you well, know... Mr. Flashy again, that's a, that's a media-generated And nickname. the Gucci gang. The Gucci gang was, I think, generated by yourself, as far as I know. Me? Yeah. Or, I well, remember that. Yeah. But, you know, those, those nicknames, some of them are for legal reasons. And yeah. Mr. Big is the great example of, and I think we did have a question about that as I'm well. I'm impressed if I did that about the Gucci gang. Yeah, I think you I did. I can't um, remember. So, but yeah, I think there is a question about... And it is because you're trying to, you know, it's difficult to to write and to discuss a, when you can't name people and you can't well, here, use the Here actually here. is a question from Lee. Hey team, love the show. It's the only podcast I listen to and I listen daily. My biggest question is who is Mr. Big? I understand you can't legally mention his name, but is there any way to discuss it in such a way that you can have a better grasp of who it, who he is? And I see, yeah. and see that, that also... Everyone's always asking who's Mr. Big, who's Mr. Big. And I think a lot of people know out there, but... Uh, um, yeah, it's just, it, it's, it's, yeah, how do you a, get it over the line? You see, what you do is you have, you you have a, a sort of somebody that the media are focused upon. And because our laws are so strict in this country, um, you kind of need that individual to have a good, strong conviction before you can start really identifying yeah. them. Yeah. Because now, without a hefty conviction, yeah. um, you have a problem because you could end up before the courts. And I mean, the great example is is Marlo Highland, yeah. who, who sued the Sunday World. That's a great example. Tell um, them that story. Marlo Highland was not named in a story. This has gone back well before either of our days yeah. in the 1990s sometime. Um, he wasn't named. There was a, a black strip across his eyes and a picture published of him. Um, Marlo Highland, at that's even at the time of his death, had relatively minor convictions. I think he'd served eighteen months for sort of traffic offences, but he was named as a one of the biggest drug dealers in in Ireland, which he clearly was. Mm, mm. Um, but he sued the Sunday World, and I think got a quarter of a million. Mm. So that's the the real warning. He sued on the basis that he had no convictions, and basically yeah, he had only small convictions. Yeah. And how do you prove? Yeah. All of that when you see how long it takes sort of the state to bring these people before a court However, of law. However, there's many other people that have launched these sort of criminal ca or cases and realised actually when it does come to court, even if you haven't been convicted, there are, there's enough st strands of evidence exactly. to, to, you know, to defend that case and defend it successfully. And um, because you don't have to prove something beyond, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. You have to prove in, in a civil case on the balance of probabilities. So Mr. Big, if, if we gave enough information about him for somebody to recognise him, um, we'd still put ourselves at risk. Yeah. So, But now there's many ways of skinning a cat. And look, usually these people eventually do end up before the courts and usually convicted. So then you identify, you know, say, for example, I'm not talking about Mr. Big, but the man convicted... Um, last week in relation to the gangland yeah. attack is the criminal yeah, no, known as yeah. Mr. Flav, whatever. Um, when somebody's before the courts, if they're not before the special criminal court, if they're before the, the central criminal court, we cannot name them yeah. at all yeah. because they have a trial pending and sort of any reportage outside the minute they hit the courts, the minute they, they're charged with something, we can only report on what happens in court. Yeah, because so, if you give the idea, and it's a clear idea, it doesn't exist in all countries, but that if you start giving a background of somebody that they won't get a fair trial in front of a jury who could have read that in the newspaper that day. Mm, mm. Here's another bit of this question here, because I think this is quite interesting. This has always intrigued me. You've covered your fair share of criminal funerals. When you're at these funerals, have you ever noticed do the boys take communion? <laughs> um, like, for instance, at David Byrne's funeral, did Freddie Thompson take communion? Not sure why I've always wondered about this, but I suppose the goal of them just fascinates me. Well, I can't really, um, I mean, the most, I've been at some really hardcore sort of funeral situations, actually. Um, I remember um, following the death of two brothers, the Corberly brothers in mm. Clondalk and um, being at that funeral and um, they were being buried and the priest quite bravely was, they'd been shot as part of an ongoing feud in West Dublin. And I remember the priest making reference to the risks of criminality and the effects of criminality on the community and a female member standing up, stopping him, taking hold of the mic and saying, 
nice. cut that out. So these things are very tense. And as far as I can remember, yes. any of them that I've been to, everybody trots up and gets communion. Yeah. But I suppose... It's if back in the day since I've been at them now, I have to say, because obviously yeah. um, I wouldn't be going in to operate undercover at a gangland funeral these days. Yeah. But um, they're very tense and it's a very uncomfortable job to be doing because firstly, you know, it's high emotion. This funeral, you're only there because it's in the public interest, really, yeah. the funeral and the, the the murder and possibly whatever is going to come in the aftermath of it. Um, but you're invasive on people's grief, yeah. no matter who they are. Yeah. And it's a horrible situation. Yeah. You're obviously not sitting there with a notebook and pen out. You're just then you're wondering, how do I get out of here? What am I doing here? You know, I've been in plenty of situations way back now, I'm talking, that have been deeply uncomfortable. And, um, you know, you, do you come away with anything that you need? I think nowadays the funerals in particular, the, you know, in actual fact, just nowadays funerals are nearly always broadcast. Yeah. So you don't have to physically put yourself in there, which could cause tensions where it's un unnecessary. Um, and yeah, I think I do feel it's sympathy. It's just to get a narration really from the priest or see what the family are saying. Yeah, I feel some sympathy for the priests because there have been occasions when people have been laid to rest and it's, you know, we've had these kind of gangland displays and priests have come under fire for not maybe addressing that. So I do think they're, they're, they're damned if they do or damned if they don't. But at any gangland funeral I've ever been, everybody trots up for communion. Yeah. But then again, what better place for a sinner than to be in a church? But listen, not only do they trot up for communion, I mean, the, the disconnect sometimes between people involved in organised crime and in generally yeah. in, in, in doing very bad things. And, you know, I, I find it fascinating when you know, you'll you'll have some somebody involved in organized crime who's probably directing murder, who is an extremely cruel individual and yet is a family guy yeah. who adores and lavishes the family. So they have these sort of two totally separate worlds and they're seen as a kind and gentle soul within the home who couldn't do enough for their families and who are very dedicated and all the rest of it. Um, you have... I remember in particular there was a, a an occasion when there was a um a the mother of a of a significant gangland criminal who had actually come into these offices at a time when there was ad sales from an office at the side of yeah. it and had come in and sort of beaten a path up to the reception to make sure to get this dedication in. And it was an, an ad seeking prayers for a relative long yeah. gone. And I remember thinking, I mean, at the time, it was a very heightened situation. Um, there had been a lot of really savage murders that had been sort of uh, suspected of being carried out by this part of the, 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 the mob. And the disconnect. Yeah. You're looking for people's prayers. Yeah. Like, what, what the... But, you and, know, and, and the belief in my right to justice when yeah, but I, I find I, that hard to get my head around. I kind the time. of do understand that more. I mean, I do think that, you know, people become a part of a world um, and, you know, it's very easy to, to, I think you can see it. If you see it in a film, it's less hard to understand. If you saw a film about the American mafia, Tony Soprano or somebody, mm. and the fact is you can see Tony loves his kids. You know, he tries his best in ways for his friends, even if he kills them. And you can understand that he's a, a person of moral complexity. And sometimes, you know, you have to say that you can understand people involved in Irish gangland can also be morally complex with good and bad sides. Mm. And, you know, look, every family that loses somebody, whether they, you know, deserve it or not, to be, you know, are killed as a result of their own activities, it's still a huge loss. I do understand that. Mm. But there is a disconnect and there is hypocrisy. But hypocrisy is a really, really human complaint. And we see hypocrisy in all areas, sports, politics, you name it. Being a hypocrite is a very human trait. Speaking of hypocrisy, <laughs> because what was extraordinary was the amount of questions, the amount of remarks, comments that we've got in. And again, anybody who wants to send in anything to us, send it to the crimeworldpod at gmail.com um, or slip into RDMs. Yeah. But um, 
the amount of questions and queries and interest around Jonathan Dowdall is yeah. phenomenal. Yeah. So we got a good few questions. I'll take a part of this one from uh, Patrick and he says, Hi, Nicola. Hi, Nicola. I love the podcast and I saw you in the limelight in Belfast and you are great. And he goes on to speak a bit about Jonathan Dowdle. But he says, um, you know, and he's saying about Jonathan Dowdle obviously messing up the case. And he says, could other criminals now try this and get away with serious crimes or have they tried it? Turn to state witness, make a complete mess of things on the witness stand <laughs> and everyone in court gets found not guilty. And we had three or Good four point. questions about yeah. that. And I actually do get asked that. Yeah. So what the basic kind of uh, theory would be is that Jonathan Dowdle and, and Jerry Hutch known each other all these years. They hatch a plan where they say um, Jonathan Dowdle or Jerry Hutch says to Jonathan Dowdle, you pretend to go state witness, say you're going to give evidence on me, do a statement, get on the stand, make an absolute mess of it and but you'll get a little deal, you do a couple of years and I'll get found not guilty. Mm. Does that make sense? Is that what happened? It's a very big conspiracy theory. Yeah. Not, but not an illogical one. So, I mean, so, I mean, personally, I don't believe it actually. No, I don't either. Because I can tell you one thing, um, we sat through, God, I can't even remember how many days of Jonathan Dowdle giving evidence, was it? I definitely aged. I think I <laughs> aged about a decade over that time. Well, so was it 10, 10 days? Mm. Let's say I can't a remember. Decade. So he, <laughs> so he's under questioning for seven hours or whatever it is a day. There is no room to hide in those things. No. They absolutely eviscerate you. Um, I, you know, if he was, if it was all some master plan, it would have all fallen apart mm. in the stand. Like, I would do not think anybody could get through that without sort of more or less the truth coming out. I think Jonathan Dowdle uh, and Jerry Hutch did not hatch it up. I think the bad feeling and venom um, was is 100% real. Um, we saw incidents after it emerged. Jonathan Dowdle was going to be a state witness. Um, there was you know, arrests, there was threats at homes, you know, all of that was not put on. Um, but what was interesting and, you know, if you were to take that theory and to think that they together cooked this up, that yeah. Jerry Hutch had a master plan that yeah. he'd get Jonathan Dowdall as co-accused in a murder plot to go state witness and to screw it all up in the witness stand. Um, there was one glaring thing that yeah. would really screw up that theory and it was the fact that we heard evidence that way back, Jonathan Dowdall had looked to talk to the cops. Yeah. When he was under arrest in about 2017. Yeah, it was when he was arrested in Dublin Airport, wasn't it? When he was on his way to fly out to Dubai. Yeah, I we think heard at that evidence point, from a retired Garda who said that he had approached him and asked him basically, you know, how did he go about yeah. talking to them on witness protection? And this was years before he was charged before yeah. he was brought to court. And in actual fact, that evidence was in the book of evidence. Yeah. And the book of evidence is given to the two people who are facing these charges. And Jerry Hutch and Jonathan Dowdall, who were imprisoned together, would have had those books of evidence. Yeah. And Jerry Hutch, you can be guaranteed, spotted that. Yeah. And I don't think would have ever trusted Jonathan no. Dowdall to try and hatch any plot with no. him after and it. I tell you, I wouldn't hatch a plot to, to go out and get a, a litre of milk no. from a shop with Jonathan <laughs> Dowdall, you know, let alone entrust them with my life. Yeah. Like, because, I mean, to God. But seriously, you, you can imagine that scenario. They're both there. They're facing this murder tra charge. They're reading their books of evidence. Jerry Hutch is no doubt dug into that. And of mm. course, he's going to see that eagle eyed and wily and, as he and, is. And he's going to know at that moment hmm. that the guy in the cell down here is capable of anything. Yeah, and I think he did know it. And there was mm. this constant pressure being put on Dowdle, um, mm. you know, explicit and implicit pre pressure in the prisons. And we've heard that separately, that that sort of level of tension was ratcheting up and Hutch was definitely suspicious. So I don't think that conspiracy theory is true. However, it would make a good film or a good drama. It, because It really it, would. <laughs> yeah. Because, it would be fabulous. But you'd have to really have, Jerry Hutch might have the, the mentality and the self-discipline yeah. and the, the, the smarts to carry it out. But I don't think Jonathan Dowdall would be a good partner in a co-conspiracy of that type. Another one on Dowdall, um, 
is from Shane. Hi, love the podcast, especially the banter between yourself oh, and you I. There we are. And we were nearly banned the other day from that because <laughs> we thought everybody hated us and thought we were so boring and banging on. Anyway, his question is regarding witness protection and around social media. And this is interesting. In an era of social media and being able to do image searches, surely it will be easy enough for them being the Dow dolls to be found, especially if his children go on social media. Are his children banned from posting anything on social media and can they return to Ireland? Very interesting question because, yeah, social media. What in the name of God in this era? How do you continue on witness protection with a family of young children? How do you remain away from the cameras? Never post an image of yourself on social media and have no... No life, no, no life digital before, life. No digital life beforehand. Yeah, because, it, I mean, it's a digital life now that we have, you know, you 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 know, every job that you go into will probably have put a picture of the people who work for the company up on, on the internet. You know, schools will have football teams if you have kids or whatever. There's a digital life for everybody. Um, you know, I actually was watching uh, TikTok and there was a thing with Dave Chappelle, you know, the comedian, and he was talking about how, how people divorced in the 1940s in America. The guy just, the husband just said, I'm going down to get a pack of the cigarettes moved 11 miles down the road and started a new family and right. nobody ever right. heard of him again. Again, yeah, yeah 11 yeah, yeah. miles down the road. Yeah. So like, and he was just living there, he got a new yeah. family now. And, but that, that world is like, that's obviously a joke, but that yeah. world, the world has narrowed like that. Yeah. And so I don't know if witness protection, again, you're relying on people like the Dowdles to be afraid, to be disciplined, to be concerned and to take it all very seriously. Um, you know, I know Jonathan Dowdle, Dowdle's decision and we heard during the trial that that was, um, certainly his wife was informed at each mm. step of the way and had been involved in some of uh, writing to the guards. Mm. Um, you know, whether there's other members of his family happy with the decisions that are made, you know, it is a burden on them. There's no doubt about that. So, I, I mean, yeah, it's, I don't know if witness protection. There's the, no I, banning anybody either no. from posting anything on social media. And the thing about it is, so Dowdall did the deal that the whole family would go on witness protection. But of course, he's given his evidence and he's now useless to the state because he was found essentially to be, he was seen as being an untruthful witness and non-believable witness by the special criminal court. So he won't be used again. So in actual fact, he's now being signed off the witness protection programme, which means that he will get help moving to a different jurisdiction, a new country. But then he's on his own and then it's kind of up to themselves because they have to kind of protect themselves, the family. Now, no doubt um, the Dowdles will tell their children and their grown up children not to be posting pictures of themselves on social media, um, you know, not to be standing into photographs. It's a huge burden and a huge pressure yeah. to live like that. And you're living with this story, this backstory of where you came from and who you are, a new name. Like, I think it's impossible. Well, I actually was watching a, uh, it's a program on the mafia on Netflix. It's just started, a name escapes me at the moment, but it's an interview with Sammy the Bull Gravano, who we spoke about earlier, and he has a son and his daughter there. And the daughter speaks, you know, and they've obviously made up over the years, but she speaks about her absolute fury and disgust at her father when he turned state witness and how she was 18 and she had to leave her whole world behind to go and move to middle the middle of America yeah. and how she absolutely hated him for years and felt she felt he yeah. was just a rat mm -hmm. and disgusted with him so you know, decisions are made, they have these yeah. long-term consequences, but other people have to put their lives on hold as well. But you also have this situation that, you know, young people and older people, by the way, can just get off their heads because of the pressure of life and they yeah. enjoy getting completely out of it and don't even know what they're doing at that yeah. point or what they're saying. Yeah. You know, so there's all that going on and going forward. Well, let's take one more question for the moment and then we'll we'll leave our question time for another day or we'll certainly come back to this. And it is, I mean, these are interesting questions, far more interesting than you or I would <laughs> ever construct. So go for the last one there for the moment. Dear Nicola and Niall, here's my question for the podcast. From what I can see, most gangland criminals are all motivated by a desire to acquire the same stuff. Fancy cars, watches, handbags, holidays, fake boobs, teeth. <laughs> Call them turkey teeth, which I think is fair. It's shallow stuff. Are they all the same or have you come across 
any criminals who are motivated by something else. And that's from Suzanne. I think now, mm. if I was to answer that, I think there's most of them have the same motivation. And I don't think it's actually about the acquisition of the money and the stuff. I think it's all about being a big shot. Mm, I was going to say power, yeah. Being a big shot yeah. in the local community. Um, I and think, then the ambitions beyond that, being a big shot in the global stage or being a big shot. Yeah, but I think... There's ambition there. They're driven by ambition. Yeah. They're driven by money. There's no doubt. I mean, really money is where it's all at. And, and that becomes agreed when the money is, you know, in such vastness that you couldn't possibly spend it. You don't need it. Um, but it's still the acquisition of it, the ownership of it. Well, I look, I mean, I think if you look at, there are other people with other motivations. I think Martin Cahill is a great example of somebody that was motivated surely by money and greed and power and all of that as well. But I think he had a genuine, uh, <laughs> it depends what way you look at it, uh, either an antisocial motivation or desire to, to cause menace to the state. There's an anarchy and that exists with a lot. And I, I think in particular, um, it's that idea that they have come from this very marginalised world that the state, as they're expected to accept it, ignored them, yeah. left them as children or as young people or whatever to just, you know, scrabble together for themselves. Maybe they've been left in abusive homes or... You know, or taken of out that. of abusive homes, put in care systems, yeah. put in borsals as it used to be, young exactly. offenders, you know, you know, beaten up by police, you know, kicked around by teachers back in the day, abused, broadly considered abused by the state. Damage, and, damage, damage people. And but, they've come along and they've thought, you know, I don't owe the state yeah. that, uh, the, the, I don't owe the state to be a good citizen. And I don't have to accept this just yeah. because I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, just because yeah. this was my hand of cards, I'll change it for myself. Some of them are motivated in, I think in particular in the past, not so much anymore, but then again, I can't see to the future, but there, there was a motivation of people to change things for a generation. And a little bit like, you know, from the point of view of the North, the sort of, you know, people who went into the provisional IRA, a lot of those people had a motivation to change things for their children, to change the sort of the, the landscape they were living in, the way they were treated, their futures, their, their what, what they should be, yeah. you know, having an ambition for. And I think there's a bit of that. I think there's a bit of that. I do think, though, you're right. And the, for me, the most motivation, like people can grow up in poverty. People grow up in poverty all across the world mm. and don't become involved in criminality. However, there are people that people that grow up in poverty, but also that suffer uh, alienation, that suffer not just uh, financial disadvantage, but are, as we said, maybe go through care system, suffer, a, mm. you know, a bad upbringing. Like those are the people that go into criminality across the world. It's not just poverty. It's also that other thing. And I think those people, some of those people, they're left with this because of how the circumstances that they've grown up with, they've carried this feeling of not, you know, I'm not good enough or people don't think I'm good enough and I'm going to show them. And sometimes the only way to show them is through violence mm. and fear. They can inspire fear in, 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 a, in a community. And, you know, once they're inspiring fear, they're not feeling that that feeling. And so and I think the ambition there, becomes that I wasn't given this, so I'm going to take it. Yeah, but I'm also, taking it anyway. and also a sort of a belief in themselves mm. that, that, you know, that, you know, that feeling of, of basically low self-esteem mm. and that's, it's a reaction against it. That's a kind of a deep thing. And if you go through, right, this is something that people don't think about, but you sometimes see these major criminals come to court mm. and you'll hear them as they're convicted. And you'll hear their, their defence barrister and they'll talk about them being on antidepressants, yeah. being in counselling. And you can dismiss that and say, sure, how, what, what are they depressed about? Sure, they're having people killed and all. But it doesn't mean they're not depressed. Mm. And what the core of all that has to be a, a horrible feeling about Tony yourself. Soprano is what you're describing. Exactly. Like, um, you know, also, I suppose you have to recognise that like in every bit of the world, we, 
there's different types of people. There's all sorts of a melting pot of personalities yeah. and personality disorders and everything in there. And there are some people in there who haven't had a bad upbringing and who haven't had any sort of things like that we're yeah. talking about. But they're just probably lacking an empathy. They've got some yeah. sort of a slight sort of personality disorder that gives them an ambition, a ruthless ambition yeah. that they and they want to become... Yeah. As big as they can. A big shot. The the and remember, if they if those people grow up in very middle class backgrounds, they might join Fianna Fáil or Fianna Gael yeah. and become, oh, become politicians. Our, yeah, so, I, I mean, let's been, not let's not say that that or there's there's people that have been in all sorts of banking and everything that if they'd grown up on 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 tough estates might have ended up being criminals. It's one of the most asked questions. When are you going to start looking at the criminals down in the doll, Nicola? Yeah, well. Well, look, let's leave that there for the moment. We haven't got to half or even a quarter of what we have in, but um, we'll go through them and maybe some some of them that are relevant to certain podcasts we'll do, we'll put them into the certain podcasts or maybe we might just come back and have another one of these little okay. Q&A. Yeah, but we never actually came back to what you would have done if you hadn't been a crime reporter. Oh. Job wise. Do you know what I had? What? I would have loved to do. Not. I would love a couple of little jobs that I would love to do, right? Mm -hmm. I would love to water plants <laughs> in offices. <laughs> you know those people that come in and they water the plants? Yeah. I just think that is most serene. Yeah. Lovely, floaty. It's almost like you have a sort of a Harry Potter uh, invisible <laughs> sort of jacket. I really can't you. see it, but. And the other thing, I would have loved to have been a post. Woman. A postwoman? Yeah. Why, just the exercise and... I just love the whole idea of that job. I think it just is... I just think it's just such a lovely job. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what so, I... What, and do I'd you know what my I, little dog with me and I'd go around door to door and give people their... and have a little chat. Do and you know, ask what, people do you know what I think I could have been in what? another life? A manny. What is a manny? A male nanny. What? <laughs> Do you know, like a, like a childminder, a male you child. Think you could yeah. have been, why? Yeah. Because I just, some. I think like, and I have my own kids who are grown up and they might not agree. No. But I like. Smaller children. Small, yeah, minding children. Small, small children. Yeah, I think so. I could have been a good male nanny. Because, kind of, I mean, we're both in agreement that the teenagers aren't the easiest, okay? <laughs> no, they're not, so they're not. No, I, yeah. I love hanging out with little kids. And the funny <laughs> things they say, they do make me laugh. So um, if it all goes our ways, but maybe that we'll is, just... I wasn't expecting that. I have to say from you, yeah. Or go on. I could have. I think I could. Yeah, I could have been. Uh, yeah, I think a male nanny was, was an unusual. Was, is that all you could have been? No, I would have. Been... I think I would have liked to have been a teacher. Would you? I think. I think I come from a long line of teachers. You do, and um, I think you would have made quite a good teacher. Good, a sort of academic. Yeah. But uh, anyway. And look, here we bloody well are. Here we Where bloody well are. Where did it all go wrong? I don't know. Is it too late to start a dog walking plant? <laughs> plan? I'll mind the kids while you, while Nicola waters, waters your plants, plants. And delivers your post. your dog. Delivers your post. My ambitions are just, yeah, no, that's what I would have liked. <laughs> that's what I would have liked. Okay. All right. Leave it there. Thanks, Nicola. I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts.